Our next speaker is Karen Simmer, who was the inaugural Professor of Newborn Medicine at UWA, and she's currently an Emeritus Professor in the Medical School. Um, so I, I think she's going to build on what Steve's done, in particular looking at how we balance all our competing priorities. Thank you, Karen. Thanks. Good morning, everyone, and um, thanks for getting up on a cold, wet day and showing your interest in the topic. Um, a lot of what I'm saying is actually going to um, support what Steve has said, um, and I obviously have a different perspective, particularly as a woman. So first of all, I was going to define what we're talking about, and this is our Academy's definition of what a clinical scientist is. Um, they work across the cutting edge of health, combining clinical skills and trailblazing research. They lead the discovery and development of new treatments, reveal insights into health and disease, and their work has significant impact on patient care. <clears throat> the bar has been raised. I referred to myself as a clinical academic, which purely meant that I worked across health institutions and universities, that I did clinical work and research. But for you now, you have to do trailblazing research and really, really have an impact. So I think everything's got a little bit harder. I'm going to talk today a little bit about myself. I've been asked to talk a little bit about my personal um, journey and why I've been asked to speak today. And then, uh, obviously, some of the roles of a clinical scientist and how we might prioritise or balance those roles. Mm. Sorry. So um, I came to Perth in 2001. Um, I was asked to apply for the job, which is a good way to start new in a fresh state or country because people want you to be there. And um, you can only be a good leader if people want to follow you. Um, the position was a new position. It, it was um, a bit of a trial of combining a, a professor employed by the university, paid by the university, and also a, a director or head of a tertiary service um, in Western Australia. <clears throat> So I was in charge of the neonatal intensive care in, uh, at King Edward Hospital, at um, Perth Children's Hospital, which was Princess Margaret Hospital, and also the Newborn Emergency Transport Service. Um, when I retired in 2020, they decided to split the role back into two. So you'd have a professor and you'd have the health department um, employed director. Um, and it really saddens me to see that because um, they don't see that the strength came in the amalgamation of the roles. So if you put the university employed professor in charge of recruitment and staff development, in charge of 80 to 90 million dollars a year budget, in charge of 700 staff, in charge of space and rosters, you can really um, have an impact on how clinical care is um, delivered, how staff are developed, how you build up a reputation for your specialty and your, and your state, and how you <coughs> deliver evidence-based um, care. <clears throat> I'm going to give you an example. Is there any way I can go forward on, on the mouse as well or not? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Anyway, I'll give you an example. It was probably one of the easiest things we did, but also probably one of the things that got the mass highest media profile, which was developing a human milk bank in Western Australia. So this comes out of a passion for um, breastfeeding and for human milk and particularly uh, the importance for a preterm infant and seeing many mothers struggle to, to express enough milk for their baby and um, also the recognition that HIV was transmitted via breast milk and all informal ways of donating milk had been shut down in the 80s. 
So if we wanted to have a human milk bank in Australia and we wanted to make that in Western Australia. So um, we applied for a rain priming grant to develop the bench top um, processes that would retain the bioavailability of the wonders in human milk, but also make the product, product safe by eliminating risks of viral and bacterial um, transmission. We got a telethon fellowship to employ a scientist for a year to set up um, the milk bank. And um, the Stan Perron Foundation um, um, gave us the money to buy the equipment. And then we just started it. The health department knew about it, Canberra knew about it. Um, and the ongoing costs were just then um, um, engulfed within the health department's budget. And after three or four years, we could show that the costs were heavily outweighed by the reduction in serious pathology, such as necrotizing enterocolitis. So um, the milk bank um, continued for um, well, over 15 years now. We could not have done that, I don't think, if we didn't truly have an academic health um, unit. Yeah. I should not have it. Down button work most reliably. Yeah. If you just use the down button, just there, that one there. That's it. Oops. <laughs> Hmm. You might need your magic touch, Steve. Oh, oh page down. Okay. Oh, no, I'm going to put it up there. Okay. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about where I was, um, my journey before I came to Perth in two, 2001, and um, take the opportunity to mention um, some of the mentors and the people who influenced uh, me significantly and their advice, what their advice to me was at the time. So um, I started off at Sydney University where I did my um, medical degree and um, then became an intern at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital uh, and with rotations through to the Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children um, and King George V um, Maternity Hospital. Um, and my mentor at the time was a man who just returned, uh, a neonatologist who just returned from Oxford. And he said, if you really want to make a difference, you're going to have to do research. If you're going to be taken seriously, you have to have a PhD. And to do both those things in the world in the early 80s, you're going to have to go overseas. Um, so I, I followed his advice and I went to the UK um, they liked Australian um, doctors and I, I got a job as a senior registrar and then a research fellow and a lecturer at London University and at St Thomas's Hospital. At St Thomas's Hospital, my um, supervisor was the Queen's physician, a lovely gentleman, and he um, instilled in me discipline for research, seeing things through, hard work, the importance of publishing, getting grants, he, he was very generous with his time. When I came back to Australia after five years, I worked at Flinders uh, University and Flinders Medical City uh, Centre in Adelaide. And uh, that was the stage where I had to, I was just by myself, so I had to set up my own research group. I had to start my own research group and then build it up to papers in the Lancet and prestigious journals. And I also had to um, start well, I didn't have to, I chose to start my family um, in Adelaide. And after about a decade in Adelaide, I, I came to Perth. Now, um, I didn't have any men mentors in Adelaide, but when I came to Perth, I did a leadership in women, uh, leadership for women course at UWA. And luckily for me, I was allocated the vice chancellor as my um, mentor. Um, at about that time, I was also the chair of the academic board at the university, so we had plenty to talk about. Um, and I used to always say, why won't you talk to me about leadership? You know, I want to learn from, from you. 
and Steve, you'll like this. He said, oh, for heaven's sake, you only need to know one thing about leader leadership, and that is generosity. And if you remember that, you'll be fine. And I looked around at my male colleagues and wondered how many of them were, were generous. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's going to be... And I talked to him, I said, well, I don't see much of that around. And, you know, I actually reflect back, and I think that was really, really good advice and in, uh, important um, advice, even though difficult to follow at times. Anyway, um, the picture is at Harvard University because um, the Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor at UWA did um, sponsor and nominate me to do a residential course at Harvard Business School on um, leadership and that was three months and it was a fantastic uh, experience. <coughs> and um, that was the first time really that I started thinking about the inequality of sexes because in um, that annual intake into that very prestigious course were 178 people from all around the world and there were only eight women and that was in 2011. And, I, you know, I, I just find that amazing. Yes, you needed to be sponsored because it was very expensive and nominated and then you had to be selected out of the thousands of people that were put forward. But it really shows at the senior levels how there still was a great inequality, I think, in opportunity. Um, <clears throat> what I, I learnt a lot of things at Harvard um, and the people who work for me are sick of me quoting things, but a couple of the important things was never waste a crisis. When things are looking really hard, you can turn that crisis into an opportunity. And that is so true. Another important thing is always stand up for what is right. Defend others, defend your team, even if it comes at a personal cost to you. Um, leaders can't be afraid to stand up and speak up when things uh, matter. So, we better get on to the topic of the talk, which is what are the roles of a clinical scientist. Um, I know it's very difficult to have uh, interaction in a talk, but it'd be really great if you could come up with two or three things that you think are important. My next slide, this of things that I think are important. Would anyone like to come up with a few things? Prioritise? Nothing? <laughs> Yep. Balance. Balance. Yep. Balance between. It's like prioritising. Prioritise. Really important. You talk about the 2080 rule, which is um, if you look at the list of things you've got to do, if you're a list writer in every day, 20% of those things will cover 80% of what is important. So you've got to make sure that you put do those 20% of things first because you're unlikely to get to the whole list rather than the things that are easy to do. Yep. Come on. A couple of roles of a clinical scientist. How hard can it be? Yes? Evidence-based? Yes. Deliver evidence-based, high-quality, safe care, clinical care. Yep. Yep. Identify gaps in research. Yes. Do research that matters. That, as a clinical scientist, do research that, that needs to be done that matters. Yeah? Partner with the students so that you research the things that matter to your patients. Yes. Excellent. Yep. Um, lifelong learning and continuing development. Yep. Okay, good. You've got things that I haven't even put on my slide, which is good, but <laughs> quite, quite right. Yes? I think along those lines, look at the outcomes you want to achieve yep. to steer the the uh, the uh, I guess the science behind it to get translation outcomes. I think that's really good. Yeah, that's good. It covers a few things. Be be able to translate or be prepared. Different sets of skills to translate what you've found into practice. Um, and also, you touched upon I think something that's really important is have a strategy for your career. Well, the things um, that 
I put on the list, but thank you for that input because I didn't cover everything. Obviously provide clinical care at uh, uh, the highest level evidence-based care that you can, but continually to develop your knowledge and skills as, you, as your career pro progresses. Certainly in uh, the neonatal intensive care unit we, and in research, you work as a team. So you have to be a good team member or a good leader and learn how to collaborate with others. Research topics that matter to you, that you're passionate about, but also that matter to your patients. Be able to communicate them, publish your findings and be able to translate your findings. Develop a strategy for yourself and for your team. This is one of the most important things in my career anyway. Recruit, recruit the very best people that you can to work in your team. Lead and manage people and funds. And you're probably going to have to learn about doing that. We're not born necessarily to be a great leader. We're certainly not born with all the skills to manage the team and we're certainly not born or taught in medical school how to manage money and funds. We have to teach, train, develop and mentor staff. Another thing that's really important to me that I'm going to touch more upon is we have to advocate for our patients. We have to nurture our own family and our own friends and we have to care for our own physical and mental health. Why? Because it improves the clinical outcomes of our patients, <laughs> it enhances the reputation of our team and our state which therefore will help in getting funding which you need to do your research and you also have to survive and enjoy the, your, your journey. Will it be easy? No. There's some awful people out there and there's some <laughs> awful <laughs> barriers and you know when you say you're going to go, you've got a strategy and you're going to go out and you do this and there'll be people that will tell you they will do everything they can to stop you doing it. You know, get over it. Those people are out there, the barriers are out there. Don't be afraid to fail. I think Steve mentioned that, you know, move on, try again. Don't be afraid to take risks and speak up. And also, I've put here, and Steve mentioned it as well, celebrate the success of others. Celebrate when you, your friends or your colleagues um, do well. So, um, how did I balance um, the roles? So, obviously, we're talking about balancing uh, the clinical and uh, the research roles as a clinical scientist and later I'll talk a little bit about probably what's more difficult, balancing um, having children, family and, uh, and um, work. <coughs> so um, I think, as I said, the most important thing is to recruit the very best people and for the consultants or you know, to start, this is the start of your career. You're not getting a consultant post and just relaxing into the job. This is when you've got to start and develop and, you know, what are you going to do once you become a, a consultant? Um, and once you recruit your staff, you've, you've got to um, delegate to them important tasks and let them get on with it and trust them to come to you when there's a problem. Mentor them, but let them develop themselves. And then you've got to embed, or what I did, embed research into everything we did. So in uh, the neonatal group, we have the pharmacists, the physios, the speeches, the psychologists, they've all got done their PhD and graduated with their PhD while they've been working in our team. And the consultants and senior registrars and scientists as well. So if we embed research into clinical care, how do we ventilate the patients? How do we nourish the patients? How do we make sure their growth um, and brain development is optimal for their long-term health and development? How do we prevent infection? How do we manage the inflammatory process. If everything is embedded into our care um, and, and, and um, often publishing those papers and putting them get into a PhD it is a way of recognising that uh, research and, and making sure that research is of a high quality and has um, an impact and is translated. The next aspect that I thought is incredibly important is how to advocate for your patients. So 
Um, I, I am a neonatal paediatrician. I do run intensive care, a lot of uh, critically sick babies and often very, very preterm babies. And we have uh, 130 tertiary beds, which is a lot of beds compared with other disciplines. When I came to um, um, Western Australia, these beds weren't counted as beds, even though with DRG funding, um, we bought in many times our budget and funded our funding, our D, the funding that our DRGs bought in, funded many other disciplines in paediatrics. Our beds weren't counted. Our patients weren't called patients, they were called babies. Our um, intensive care units weren't called that, they were called nurseries. The beds weren't called beds, they were called cots. So they, it was really hard to bring these little kids up to the level of, of an adult um, patient. <clears throat> and it, still now I think the mothers are given a lot more um, preference than um, or su support for their needs than the babies. And mothers are important too. But <laughs> So <laughs> this is going on to adv uh, just, you know, banging back the theme of advocacy and speaking up. I even even now, it's not a very popular slide to put up when we're at Fiona Stanley Hospital, but <laughs> yeah, but it's no offence to Fiona Stanley Hospital, but you know, you really have to continue, not be afraid um, to, and bullied into not speaking to the media if you're really advocating for your patients' needs. And, and to be honest, you know, if a neonatal, all of a neonatal intensive care is to be moved down at Fiona, Stanley Hospital, it will be inevitable that um, tertiary um, services such as paediatric surgery will be duplicated in two sites, the Children's Hospital and Fiona Stanley Hospital, and we've barely got enough um, population in, in WA to maintain expertise as it is. So to split that could be um, incredi incredibly damaging to the health of our patients in the long term. So um, this is about getting over um, nastiness in the workplace. There will be always be people out there who want to be, who want to undermine you. And how it's easier said than done, but to to to, to move on and let it go um, is hard. But you need to learn how to. Do do it, and also frustrations with the bureaucracy in, in health. It can really um, knock you, you down and you need to be able to manage yourself and to get over that. You, one way of doing that is to have a positive strategy, to support your team and your people, um, work out what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what the opportunities are, and keep positive and keep moving forward. For the neonatal group in WA, we had a strategy, and um, as Steve alluded to, it's pretty hard over on the West Coast to compete with the East Coast. There's so much more of them, they get so much more funding, there's so much more research institutes, and they're so close to each other and so easy for them to collaborate compared with us over the West Coast. So we need to be able to join them and compete with them when necessary. So our strategy was to become the centre of research excellence for preterm infants in Australia and we um, collaborated and sought advice and luckily got that grant for the first year that we applied. Our other strategy was because we have a very big intensive care unit, we were the main intensive care unit for recruitment into trials led by other people. So our strategy was, well, let's do a really important clinical trial and, uh, where all the other states would recruit into, but more than that, an international clinical trial that would recruit from all over the world and is led from WA. And that took us a couple of times um, attempts to get the funding and we did seek advice from um, key clinicians in WA who were incredibly helpful and quite harsh on our application. I can remember one intensivist at Perth, um, at Royal Perth Hospital, you know, we said, but look at these great reviewer comments and we still didn't 
get them and he read them and he said, you think these are great? They're terrible, can't you see what they're telling you? you know? So we totally rewrote everything. We, we collaborated with some um, centres over East, but we managed to, to get the funding to lead the big international trial. The point is we had a strategy and we asked for help um, to achieve that. So, um, balancing family. Uh, now, let's for, let, let me talk first about balancing being a clinician and an a academic. What's my advice about that? First, choose where you're going to work. So, a teaching hospital would be my preference but I've worked with some very good people in ENT or ophthalmology who do work in private practice as well. But as an neonatologist or an obstetrician, I think it would be hard to do, be a clinical scientist and have a private practice running as well. Choose where you want to work and maybe choose who your boss is going to be. Not all bosses value research. You need to have time to write grants, publish papers, meet people, collaborate people. Great if you can get a fellowship, um, as Steve mentioned, from NHMRC, or there are plenty of other um, f fellowship opportunities around. But you should be able to do clinical research, particularly as part of a team, within your job uh, within um, the health department. If you're publishing papers and you haven't got a PhD, why wouldn't you enrol part-time into a PhD and have a theme to your research, a focus for your research, and pull that together in a PhD as well? We are time poor. That's our problem. So you're going to need help. And when I first came to Perth, a senior professor at UWA said to me, you need help, you need a fellow, you need a research nurse, you know, you need a scientist. You, you're going, and to do that, you're going to need funding. So you, you're going to have to get some grants to get some funding to make time for you to do your research. <coughs> Which leads me on to how do you balance all your family demands? Um, because uh, time is one thing family does take up. Now, it is a joy, everyone will say, the biggest joy in your life to have a family and it enhances every aspect of your life, including your work. So how are you going to prior prioritise things? For me, breastfeeding and attending international conferences didn't work. So there are times in your life when you're not going to be travelling around the world building up um, your reputation. That doesn't matter. There'll be other times later when your kid's a little bit older when you can. Or your team members can do the travel, nominate them to take up the invitations that you get. I'm not a great home entertainer. It's very hard when people are vis visiting from overseas and you're with them all day at work to then rush home and you know um, entertain 12 people for di dinner. You have to think of some alternatives um, for that. You have to have a plan, you have to be ple flexible and you have to prioritise what's important to you at any stage of your life. You can't do everything every year, but you should be able to do everything over perhaps 20 or, th or 30 years. So I think I'll finish up on that point. Thank you for listening to me ramble. Thanks very much, Karen. Do we have some questions? Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you had any tips for getting successful grant funding when your area of research is fairly niche in maybe, like for example, my research focus is respiratory failure in children with neuromuscular disorders, which are pretty rare disorders. It's not, you know, it's not a huge community and often applications get knocked back because there's things that are just more important or affect more patients. Do you have any tips in those sort of circumstances? Well, I would get some, um suggest you apply to funding 
local Western Australian funding opportunities. And I think if you put together a good grant application, get other people to read it and give you comments, that there's no reason why you wouldn't be successful in getting um, funding locally. And with that, you can have some publications, have some data and, and things. So when you do apply more on the, in the national arena, you know, you've, you've got a background of research. Yes. Can I just, can yep. I just add to that? Um, the other thing is that most of the the national funding uh, schemes now stress that impact is not about the size of the problem. Uh, it's the strength of the grant and the demonstration that you can make a difference is important. Get other people to read your grant application. Um, to really get as much help as you can in making it really good. Other questions? So I, I think I'm hearing a common theme that uh, to be sort of taken seriously, a, a PhD seems to be sort of a, a quite a sort of necessary sort of thing to be doing as part of your, after you've, I guess, during or after you've finished your clinical training. And is there any sort of counter arguments to that? Are there any sort of have there been success stories of people who, are, who can be a clinician scientist without having to complete a PhD? Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure there are. My point was, as, as a part-time PhD student, um, you know, you've got six years, you ca you're publishing papers anyway, and a thesis really, you know, you can put six papers together with an introduction and a, and a discussion. So. I would just advise that it's it's a good strategy to have. It, it gives you supervisors, you know. It, I, I don't know what do you other people think. I, I found doing a PhD was invaluable. You know that the the, the the methods that you learn and the experience. It, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. You can you, you can do it while you work full time, or you can work part-time or you can do it a couple of years um, full-time you know there's all sorts of variations how you might do it depending on your funding and, and, and your situation. Anyone else seen you want to comment on that? Yes Stephen. Yeah look it's a starting point um, but it's an investment it, it's going to cost you money to do a PhD one way or the other uh, but it's an investment in your future. And I think that, uh, um, sure, there are plenty of examples of people making a success uh, in clinical research without a PhD or an MD, but they are the minority. I mean, it, it's 80% uh, um, of successful clinical researchers have a PhD. Um, many of the people in the slide I showed um, are consultants who have full-time jobs. And yeah, they did a lot of um, the writing at nights and on weekends and on the holidays, and their research was embedded in what we were doing in the neonatal units. Um, so there are various ways of, uh, of, of making it happen. So thanks very much, Carolyn. Join with me. In Thank you, Karen, for another fantastic preparation.